Welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Stephen Sacker. Watching TV is something pretty much all of us do for news, sport and entertainment. But how much of what we stare at on the box do we actually remember? Well, over the past 50 years, my guest today produced some of the most memorable, brilliant and shocking TV drama ever made. Tony Garnett's subjects, homelessness, illegal abortion, police corruption, point to his radicalism. He uncovered dark corners of British life. How much of his motivation came from the dark corners in his own life? Tony Garnett, welcome to Hard Talk. Sometimes it feels simplistic to make causal links between people's professional lives and their personal lives, but in your case, would you say there are grounds for making a very direct connection? There are. Of course there are with everyone. Um, sometimes they're unconscious and remain unconscious. Um, and I've only just recently, finally, through hammering through uh, the first draft of this memoir, mm. realised what they were, realised what the connections were. But I think it's true of everyone. Well, you, you fascinate me in that sense, because you've waited until, you know, pretty much your 80, late 70s, 80 years old, to write a memoir which has exposed very bleak and dark things about your own past, which, which in a sense cast new light upon your professional work as a television and film producer. But, but if we start with the, the personal, as a child, you went through the most extraordinary trauma which most people watching this would not be able to imagine. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Well, just very, very briefly. It was 1941, December, um, the bombs were dropping in Birmingham. My dad was on a reserved occupation working in a munitions factory. It was down the air raid shelter every night, up the next morning to see if the house was still there. Mm. Um, but I was loving it. It was a lot of fun for me. You were a kid, five I, years old. I was old. five. Exciting. You know, it, was, it was pretty exciting. Mm. Um, and I was in a very loving family. My mum adored me and my dad was strict, but I worshipped him and my aunt and uncle were next door. It was and my grandma was down the road. It was a typical old-fashioned, close family. Mm. Um, my mum got pregnant, and that, my mum and dad decided, for reasons some of which have probably died with them, that it just wasn't the time to have another baby. And, you know, in those days, it was illegal, and, of course, it was also against God. Abortion, you mean? Abortion, abortion was completely illegal. Completely yeah. illegal. So they found an abortionist. Uh, there's always a woman in, or there was always a woman in the neighborhood who would help girls. And she had this abortion and something went wrong with it. And she felt very, very ill. My dad, one night, three nights later, went to work. I was sent to bed. When he was on nights, I slept with her, which I loved. And I was woken up in the middle of the night and there was my mum banging on the adjoining wall to my uncle's house next door, shouting and screaming mm. and wailing. It was just a sound I'd never heard before, I've never heard since. Um, and my mu aunt and uncle came round, uh, whisked me away, of course. And then, I mean, some of this I learned later, of course, and pieced it together. Um, my mum died during the night before my dad got home. And the nobody said anything to me. The next morning I was at my auntie's house and my dad came in and he was, he was weeping. I mean, in the most I mean, uncontrolled way. And I, I'd never seen a man cry. Hmm. I never believed my dad could cry. Um, I was sent down to my grandma's. Then I was sent off to an aunt. I saw my dad once more on Christmas Day. He came round just for half an hour or so, and I sat on his knee. Um, and then the day after New Year, he got a hose, put it in the gas, and lay down with a bottle of scotch, and he 
didn't finish it. So um, he gassed himself to death. Yes, and I, I, my, my aunt said, "Your your father's dead," and I said, "Nobody explained anything to me. Nobody um, more or less said, how do you feel?'" Um, to be fair to them, I think they were probably planning when I was much older to tell me these awful things. I mean, it's 75 years on, and I can tell, even the way you tell the story today, it lives with you in a very real sense now. Well, it lives with me now, but it didn't, because I buried it. Right. I, I could, my theory now is that I couldn't experience it. In fact, it was almost an act of self-preservation to bury it. Um, but remember, for them, not only had they lost... My grandma and granddad had 12 children, and so my mum was one of the favourites of them all. Um, not only had they lost two people that they loved, but a, an abortion, a suicide, attempted suicide was against the law. Yeah, these are and all against, tab massive taboos. Yes, and against God. I mean, just put yourself back into those times, into that class. Very respectable, working class people. Um, the shame of it. You, you somehow saved yourself. Well, you know, to put this into context, this was the Second World War. Mm -hmm. All over Europe, little children were sure. having it a lot worse than I was. They were going to concentration camps. Their mm. parents were taken away mm. from them. The suffering and the starvation. Mm. So, you know, it was, it was um, difficult. Um, and I had to deal with it. But we all have difficulties. Not, not as difficult as that, perhaps. But, you know, you, you don't judge life by the hand that people are dealt. You don't judge life by how they play the hand. And how you deal with it, and, yeah. and you've got to deal with it. Well, and I, de I dealt with it by burying it, and um, only very gradually and recently have I been able to resurrect it. I, I, I totally take the point about the burial of it emotionally and personally, but of course you didn't necessarily bury it entirely because it clearly coloured your consciousness, your awareness of how the world worked. Because it seems to me, if we get on now to the beginnings of your filmmaking and television uh, drama making career, that you always had a very strong sense that there are powerful people in society, but there are an awful lot more powerless people in society, people who have bad stuff happen to them and for whom the system doesn't really work. You were, in a sense, quite radical, quite young. Yes, just to tease that out a little bit. Um, um, first of all, my work has been about secrets. My whole childhood and adolescence was, I don't want any more secrets. I, I interrogated relatives mercilessly. I just wanted to know. Mm. And that, I think, looking back on it now, all these connections were unconscious to mm. me until fairly recently. Um, my work is, I want to expose the secrets. Um, like, for instance, we did a, a film, Gordon Newman wrote some screenplays, Les Blair directed them, uh, about the Metropolitan Police Detectives yeah. in the 70s. Uh, I wanted to know the truth. And the abuses that uh, were within the police The force. abuses in the police. The police had uh, interrogated my dad. The, uh, there'd been a policeman outside the house. They'd followed him wherever he went. After your mother's death. After my death, mother's mean, death, yeah. because they wanted to find the abortionist. Mm. Um, uh, my dad didn't shop. He didn't, didn't say anything. He killed himself. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Um, Let, let's go to a, a clip which will give people, many of whom, of course, are young and won't know your work so well, but let's go to a clip which encapsulates the degree to which you, in the end, dramatised some of the terrible things that you, you know, had somewhere within your own consciousness. Let's start with Up the Junction, a, f a, a drama that you made in 1965, had a huge audience on the BBC, obviously filmed in black and white, but it was all about the story of a backstreet abortion. Let's just play in a, a little and quite difficult to watch clip. Let's have a look at this. Take the lowest figure, 52,000 abortions a year. That's 1,000 abortions a week. Something like five or six every hour of every day. And that's taking the minimum figure. 
<laughs> it's a pretty extraordinary piece of film because there you've got, obviously we've just taken a very short clip, but you've got a very graphic portrayal of a woman in the midst of terrible suffering. But you chose, in a pretty new and revolutionary way for television, to juxtapose that with a, a very sort of measured, dispassionate voice giving some true facts, some, some journalism about the, the, the scale of the problem of illegal abortions. It was sort of a mix of drama and fact which Britain hadn't really seen before. No, a lot of it was new. That voiceover was my GP. Was it? My, yes, my doctor from Kentish Town. Was it? Dr J Don Grant, who his specialty was pregnancy and, and, and birth and so on. He knew a, a lot about it. Did you tell anybody that actually you, were you wanted to be involved in this project partly because your own mother had died in a backstreet abortion? No, I told no one. Why? Um, I, I, I don't know why. I mean, wh why would I? It, um, because it, that it, would give is... everybody a sense of how much it mattered to you. But why... I don't know, in Birmingham we don't talk about stuff, you know, we <laughs> keep things to ourselves. It's, it, it, why would I burden people with all of that? There's one thing I want to correct, if I may. Yeah. It, it is an excusable shorthand for you to say films that I made. I've never made a film. Produced ever. is the right word, um, I guess. You could do my role on it if I produced it or mm. wrote it or directed it. But for me, films are social activities. Mm. You know, and they're not like novels. Um, and I've always gathered people around me and we've worked together very closely. Um, so, and one um, of the men you've worked closest with is Ken Loach. And of course, Ken Loach has had a fantastic career and has won prizes at Cannes and all over the world. And, and you and he, I think, are to this very day regarded as pioneers of, and in a sense, sort of revolutionaries working with this idea of social realism, of, of using actors who are encouraged to extemporize, to be spontaneous, not to obsess about memorizing scripts, but to just sort of let drama unfold and, and sort of live with the drama unfolding. Uh, how new was all of that? And, and do you accept this notion that you sort of set a trend which still matters to a great many filmmakers around the world? Well, I don't know. I don't see much sign of the trend now, frankly, but um, I, I, I never thought of it like that. This all started for me as an actor and the terrible way actors are treated by, or were treated by everybody and mm. still are to some extent. Um, and I thought they'd got everything wrong, everything wrong with the attitude to screenplays, the attitude to lights and cameras, that every, the actor was in the service of all of that. But I wanted all of that to be in the service of the actor. In fact, it's the audience that sees the actor or the character. They shouldn't even see the actor. And when I met Ken, we were both working on the Wednesday play. I, I knew, I, we didn't have to talk very much because we just knew of each other. He'd seen the light too. And Ken is the, the finest director of actors, of, of conjuring a performance from, a truthful performance from actors mm. that I've, I've ever worked with. And so we were brothers from, from the start. Well, talking of truthful performances and, and the, the power that television drama can generate, let's look at one more clip. That's perhaps the most famous project you collaborated on, and that's uh, a drama called Kathy Come Home, which oh. exposed the problem of homeless, poverty and homelessness in, the, in Britain of the mid-60s. And this scene we're going to see is, again, very upsetting. It's based on a true life story. It's where the authorities come to take away the children of a young mother. Let's have a look. I 
tell you what, it's hard to watch that and not feel a stab of pain in your heart. And yeah, well, um, I'd felt it because I'd lost my mum. I mean, I'd been taken in by the family, but your mum is your mum. I remember there was an, ad, was an advertisement in, when I was young for something or other. It said, accept no substitutes. And there are, there are no substitutes. Your mum is your mum. What I'm thinking about right now is the degree to which your films had such an impact that they became almost part of the political discourse in Britain. I mean, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you actually had a meeting with the British government's housing minister as a result of Cathy Come Home. The furore, 12, 14 million people had watched it. The nation was talking about this problem of young people who couldn't get homes, who were forced out of homes and ended up losing their families. Uh, you made a difference. I mean, do you feel your films, going back to the 60s and beyond, made a difference? Well, it depends what you mean by making a difference. When I was young and arrogant, I thought we could make a film and change the world. Well, films don't do that. Um, the most that a film can do, to use an old um, political phrase, is raise consciousness so that people who are active in politics can be affected and then they can change the world. We did have a meeting, uh, Jeremy Sanford, the writer, Ken Loach, the director, and me, with the minister at the ministry in a beautiful, huge room uh, down in Whitehall. I'd never had a flat as big as that. And it was a very English occasion. Uh, he was there with his permanent secretary. Uh, we sat down for tea. And the china was very nice and the biscuits were very palatable. Um, and we sipped tea while we talked. And he was extremely complimentary about the film, but in the end said, well, but what can one do? And I said, build more houses. And he looked at his permanent secretary who smiled back at him. And, <laughs> and then we were out on the street again um, in Whitehall. All right, well, I take the point then. Maybe it didn't change anything in the short term. But I just wonder, you know, there's two things that strike me. And, and the first one is this. I find it hard, being a professional, having worked in telly for quite a while myself, I find it hard today to think of filmmakers and films on television or indeed big screen that have the same kind of impact that would you know warrant a, or, or, or encourage a government minister to immediately call in the filmmaker for talks about the subject at hand i mean do you think uh, radical boundary pushing stuff is being made today on television or in film in the same way that you were doing it back in the 60s there may be some political films for the cinema for the art house circuit very low budget being made here, um, and certainly there are in other countries. But you won't see it on television. Nothing to do with the quality of the filmmakers, uh, but because it, it wouldn't be allowed. Television now is a different business. You mean the bosses, the people who run organisations, even maybe like mine, the BBC, have, have lost their nerve, no longer interested in, in being radical, in, in confrontation, in saying difficult things? Um, I do but I don't necessarily blame them as individuals. Um, the B, the B, let's talk about the BBC. The mm. BBC lives uh, in a, a cultural and political environment. It affects that environment and is affected by it. But if you wanted to make a film like Cathy Come Home Today, would you find an easy place to put it on mainstream terrestrial television? I doubt it. And in any case, I wouldn't if I was still working in films, I would not want to produce a film like Cathy today. Um, Cathy let everybody off the hook. Mm. Cathy was not political enough. Mm -hmm. Cathy was a nice, soft, liberal film. Um, it wasn't seen that way at the time, but well, I guess it, I know... It, it didn't put the boot in where it should have done. Um, uh, so that's what I would want to do now. Uh, there, there would be no chance now. And and, and, and by the way, just, just to finish that point very quickly, when we did Cathy Come Home, there was a homeless problem, but it wasn't that huge. And most people knew nothing about it. When Jeremy Sanford um, um, told us about it, because he'd researched it, neither Ken nor I knew there was a homeless problem. And it went out and caused a stir, to put it mildly. Now, there is a huge problem of homelessness and of housing. 
acknowledged by everyone. Television has a little documentary every week or two mm -hmm. on it, and it's all over the newspapers, and nobody cares. Now, and the politicians all, of all parties have neglected it for 30 or 40 years, but they're our politicians. So maybe we live in a country that doesn't care as it used to. Well, you know, your staples, the films you, you are known for, uh, for having collaborated on, are really all about sort of class, powerlessness of so many people in society, uh, corruption and abuse, abuse of power. When you look at Britain today, you know, Britain that's just voted Brexit and exposed all sorts of new divisions between young and old, north and south, urban and rural, poor and wealthy. When you look at Britain today, do you look at a society which in some ways is in worse shape than it was when you set out in your filmmaking career? Well, it's in worse shape. It's also in better shape. There's all sorts of wonderful things happening. We value our individuality. We cooperate, we compete. It's finding a balance between those two elements in society. And now we're far too much individuals. The competition um, has, has cancelled out the cooperation. And we're an unhappy society because we're unbalanced. We need to get the balance back. If you wanted to make people care today by force of a creative medium, would you choose television or would you try to harness the internet? What, what would you do? What, if, you know, if Tony Garnett weren't 80 but were 25 and setting out to influence people, influence the debate and change the world, how would you go about it? I would, without hesitation, be working uh, on the internet. The barriers to entry into our business have more or less disappeared. When I started, very few people were allowed because it was so expensive and the technology was so complex to, 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 to master. Now, any kid in a provincial town can get a, a, a digital camera, which is point and shoot. They can edit on their laptop. Server space is cheap. There, they're there for billions of people. I mean, nobody will know you're there. But the thing it's, is, that's a marketing problem, and the kids find things. A final thought, and it may be bleak or it may not. The kind of serious message and and the serious sort of analysis of the way society works that you've always wanted to make. Is that going to find a big audience anywhere? Is that you know, if it's the internet, is that ever going to go viral, or are people too busy looking at you know, cute cats? Well, it depends on how good you are. I mean. When we were making films for television, um, there were all sorts of other things people could look at. Um, the problem now is that it's all available at all times. There's too much. It's not that there's too much, it's that, that, that the choice is there all the time. Yeah. Whereas when there were two channels of television, it was one after the other. But you still had to get people to watch. I want to end by Going back to where we started and your decision after so many years, decades and decades of bottling up the personal that has been so much a part of your life through all of this professional success, uh, you've now unbottled and you've been very open about your own tragedies and trauma. Have you conquered your demons, do you think? I'm a lot happier. Uh, do any of us ever conquer all our demons? Um, as an old psychoanalyst friend of mine said, it's our scars that make us interesting. Um, but I'm happier now. That's a great way to end. A happy thought to end with. Tony Garnett, thank you so much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you.